But, um, but listen, guys, we are just kicking off, and we're getting started on a, a really fun series that we've already had a lot of great feedback on because it's so unique, it's so different, and it's actually the, the purpose of it. As, we were, as I was praying and saying, Lord, what are, what are things that you want to be able to communicate to us? In fact, this is, uh, this is an attempt to answer a question that people are asking all the time, right now. In fact, if you go to Google, one of the top Google searches in regards to faith or whatever is how to read the Bible. Like, it's in the millions. Like, there's constant people, even though maybe millions of people, uh, not as many people are, are maybe in physical spaces like we are right now. But one of the top Google searches right now in, in regards to faith is how to read the Bible. Because for some people, it's confusing. For some people, it's difficult. Some people don't know how to approach this, you know, book that has just been around for, for so long. And so one of our attempts over the series on binge reading the Bible, which we, anybody, any Netflix, Netflix bingers, right? you know, hey, everybody, right? It's fun. And so listen, you can binge read the Bible, but if you don't know how to approach it, you're not sure what to do. And so one of the things, and this is, you know, we believe here, this is God's spoken word, that God speaks and something happens in here. And so part of this whole series is based off what we talked about in Easter, that the foundation of the Christian faith is not the Bible. A lot of people think it is. The foundation of the Christian faith is not the Bible. The foundation of the Christian faith is that Jesus rose from the grave because something was written because Jesus was risen. If Jesus had never resurrected, there would be no New Testament. There would have been no preservation of the old. The, all of that happened because something happened on a Sunday morning. A guy who died, three to, you know, a guy who died woke back up. Okay, that don't happen, all right? And so, and there was something, and he called it. It's even better. Like, you think about that, I was like, you know, it's one thing, it's amazing that that happened. What's even more amazing is that Jesus called it. And I was like, look, this is what's going to happen. Three, you know, and three days later, you're going to see me again. And then he pulls it off. I was like, yo, oh my gosh, that's even better. You know, the fact that he did that. And so, but we're looking at this because unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of Christians today, they base their faith on what's, they'll say, look, I believe in what's written, even though I haven't read it. And that is silly. I believe all that's in it. Yo, I've never read everything that's in it. And the reason why so many people every year walk away from their faith is because they walk away from an aspect of something that they never read about or an aspect that they were confused about and they didn't know how to connect one or the other. In fact, some of you have probably been on the fence for a long time in regards to believing and following Jesus because there's certain things in here that, especially in the Old Testament, that you don't know how to process. I was like, oh, I get this Jesus thing, but, but, but what is this? In fact, one of the biggest criticisms over in the new atheists and that are out right now is that they point to this Old Testament God and they say, hey, uh, how can there be this Jesus here? But how can you believe in a God who's a genocidal, psychopath, bloodthirsty individual that's in the Old Testament? How can you process the both of those? Now, to me. And there's a lot of logic in that. I understand their reasoning. But, you know, one, one thing that always makes me wonder, is sounds like, yo, okay, if you don't want to believe in God because you think this God is a psychopath, are you good with that? Like, I mean, like, if, if you, you know, like, is that your reason to not believe because that God's crazy? I'm like, do you think that's going to make him, if that was true, you know, is that, you're gonna, is that set you up for, you know, what's good night? Are you going to be okay? I was like, listen, if you believe, if that, oh, I don't believe in God because he's nuts. I don't believe in God because he's a crazy God. I'm like, that's not smart. I was like, I mean, I would buddy, buddy up with that God, right? If that's who you, if that's, if that's who you think he is, right? I wouldn't be like, bro, I can't deal with you. You know, uh, no, <laughs> I was like, that's not a, a, that's not a logical progression of thought there. I don't know. That's just me. It's interesting. And so we're looking at this because listen, there are things. There's a lot of beauty in this, and there's a lot of reasons why us as Christians today, we just don't have the new, what we call the New Testament. Because this is one book with two sections. I don't know if you've noticed. There's one that's called the Old Testament, one that's called the New Testament. And it's really, why do we call the New Testament new when it's 2,000 years old? Interesting, right? But so what is those? And so today what we're going to talk about, last week we talked about the story of the Bible, how we got the Bible, which is an amazing origin story, crazy backstory, because the church did not have the Bible for 300 years. So how did these early church, what, how, what was their faith in if there was no book? It was in the resurrection. 
But now we got this book, so now what do we do? And why is it divided in two sections? So today we're going to talk about the difference between the Old Testament and the New. So when you read something, like how do you mix the two? How do you read one in light of the other? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And so some of you, if you've ever flipped through it, okay, the, New, the Old Testament is the majority, this fatter end of the book. This is the Old Testament. This right here is all the new, all right? This is everything from Jesus beyond, and this is all before Jesus. You know, it's a lot thicker, and there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff happening in here, and so what's crazy, listen, I want you to understand this, is like everybody who wrote the New Testament, by the way, everyone who wrote the Old Testament, a lot of them, the individuals, there were over 40, about 40 authors, and everything he was written over a span of 1,500 years. And no one, especially the guys in the new, when they were writing documents and letters, they did not know that they were writing something that's going to be added to sacred scripture. Most religions that, that kind of pop up, you know, there's a, they purposely, you know, a handful of individuals or one will create a document and, you know, create a collection and say, okay, this is now the word of God. You know, the New Testament authors weren't doing that. They were writing, led, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write a letter to one specific group, to inspire to write a letter to tell this one story. And as they're doing that, over the years, certain people were realizing, wait a minute, there's something to that story. There's something to this compared to others. And they were brought together and bound and, you know, in, a, in one book, which the Bible is just one book of many books altogether. And so that's an interesting detail that these guys were not writing things, believing that they were going to write something that was going to be included in the Bible. They weren't. But why were they doing that? They were writing something. And not only that, these now non-Jews, these non-Jews, because the, the first Christians were Jewish. And as they were going out and spreading and telling the world what Jesus had done, I mean, literally within a handful of uh, years, within, I think it's uh, about 60 years or 50 years after Jesus' resurrection, Almost all of Asia and in Europe, I mean, it was crazy back. They didn't have Uber. They didn't have any of this stuff. And they got around. No internet. They couldn't just mass tweet and tag people. I mean, they had to get out there. And it was amazing to see why and how, despite the difficulties, the word of God went throughout the whole world. Why? Because it was a story worth telling. But something that was really interesting is that we have these Jews who then leave non-Jews to be Christians. And now we have all these Gentiles, which by the way, if you don't know what a Gentile is, it's a non-Jew. We have all these non-Jews interested in Jewish scripture. And you have these non-Jews looking, hey, what's that the Hebrew Bible that they had? I was like, what, what are those stories? And they have non-Jews interested in the Old Testament, what we call it. And why? Because they wanted to see. And when they started looking, they're like, oh my gosh, look, Jesus, like, he was, because Jesus, by the way, said, the scriptures bear witness of me. I've been trying to tell you since the beginning. I've been doing something new and I've been lay, laying it out. But, but you, you missed it. You didn't see it. And so now these non-Jews are getting and reading the Old Testament. They're reading Jewish scripture. And they're seeing Jesus and everything. And the Jews, too, are seeing it. And that, that kind of made uh, some of the, the non-Christian Jews a little upset because it was like cultural appropriation kind of a thing. I was like, hey, you know, like the Christians were taking the Bible that was, not, you know, there were so all these non-Jews were taking the Bible, their, their Hebrew Bible. And they're saying, hey, this is our book now. And they're like, whoa, whoa, hold on, dude. I was like, uh, you know, no. I was like, and so it was really, there was a big confusion. And, there was, and they were saying, no, see, all of these stories, Moses, David, Abraham, all these guys, it was all about Jesus. And so that made a lot of the Jews upset too. Like, uh, no, this is not, you're perverting our story. You're, you're perverting our culture. And so it was, it was crazy. But then not only that, see, unfortunately, though, even some of the early Christians for the first 20 years, the church and the early believers had a problem. They didn't know how to handle all of everything that was in the Old Testament with what they knew that God was doing. And for the first 20 years, first 20 years of the church, there was a mix and match of old things that God used to say and then now the new things. They were mixing and matching. And every time there was a mix and match, it didn't work. You know, it, the things were actually a lot of even some of what was written in the New Testament. I want you to check this out. A good chunk, the majority of what was written in the New Testament outside of the Gospels, like Paul's letters to all these churches, was Paul trying to help people to stop mixing and matching. Hey, no, no, no. He tried to correct. Listen, you guys are with in the light of the new that God has done. You're reading the old and you're, you're, you're getting it confused. Hold on. No, no, no. It's time out. And he tried to help clarify. Because, listen, mixing the old with the new is something Jesus said we weren't supposed to do. 
And so, but it was happening. And we do it today. We do it today. We mix the old and the new, and sometimes we don't realize the damages. But there's a reason why we call the Old Testament the old, which is the Hebrew scriptures, and everything beyond the new. And it's an amazing truth that I want you guys to catch. And we're going to look at that right now. And so here's the thing. There's two sections, okay, and two testaments for a reason because if each section tells a story of a covenant, all right? So there's two sections, two covenants. And so the word testament, all right, so what we call the Old and the New Testament. The, te- the word testament, it comes from a uh, Greek translation of a word that meant covenant. And so back when the Bible was getting organized and put together, there was one bishop and one uh, monk that was kind of used this phrase of the old and the new. And then they started labeling it because the Bible never came with chapter and verse and stuff like that the way we have. We just kind of did that now for better reference. And so, but the word testament comes from the word covenant. And a covenant is a promise. It is an agreement that has gone together. So when you read now anything in the Old Testament, I want you to understand this was all under one old covenant. God made a promise, and that was an old covenant. But then now when you have a new covenant, something happens. Let me ask you a question. What do you do with your old phones after you get a new one? Trade them in, right? You sell them. You know, when you get a new phone, do you still use the old one? No, no, you got to transfer the phone, right? You got to transfer the contacts. You got to transfer. I mean, you maybe use it as a backup. You kind of have it there just in case. But when you get something new, what do you do with old, right? And so it kind of moves. It goes away, steps to the side. And so that is something that we need to understand. Something happened because we call it a new covenant, meaning it replaced the old one. Whatever this old covenant was has now been replaced by a new. And that's what Jesus came to do. And that's what he did. And so we have to understand that. And so here again, we have this mixing and matching of you have people in the new covenant, but then they're trying to live in the old. Let me give an example of some of this mixing and matching. Again, you would have the early church was a mix of Jews and non-Jews. And so because so many many Jews became faith and, you know, they started believing in Jesus. And they're saying, man, the prophets and all of this, you know, hey, Jesus was a Jew. And and all of this came about because of this promise that God had made. And so they would go to non-Jews. Jews and say, hey, you believe in Jesus? Yeah. All right. Now you got to be a Jew too, because Jesus was a Jew. So if you want to follow Jesus, you also got to be a Jew. So meaning, hey, uh, you got to change the way you dress. You got to dress like us now. Uh, You got to change the way you do your hair. You got to put the little curls on the edge. Now you got to get your bangs curled. I don't even know if that's the thing they did back in the day, but I know they do it now. Right. And so, you know, you got to get the, you got to do your hair different now. You got to wear your clothes different. You got to learn. You got to speak different. You, hey, bacon, Done. Okay. You can't have that. You can't because we got to go by this now Jewish custom, Jewish law of dieting. So all you, the way you eat, the way you do this, the way everything, everything. Now you got to be a Jew to follow Jesus. And that was a problem because they were seeing this new covenant, but then they felt like we still got to be in the, they were mixing old covenant stuff with new covenant. And that's something Jesus never expected us to do. And a lot of Paul was trying, Paul was trying to break up a fight. If you ever read a lot of anything, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, Galatians, all those, those are letters to churches in different cities. Paul is literally just trying to break up a fight. You ever seen one of those? Right? When you got any things are just kind of getting at it and you got to be the peacemaker. Right? Hold on. You know, just separate for a second. That's what Paul was doing because the old was trying to mix in with the new and things were happening. And, you know, things weren't working. That's not what God came to do. It was better. And so he was trying to clarify, help explain. But that was problem. That was some of the things that were going down. And a lot of people were, you know, they were confused about it. And and so he's trying to help. And so, but but the one thing I want you to get away from this is that a testament is a covenant. Okay, so you got that? So when you see the Old Testament, what is it really, what is it saying? It's called the Old Testament. Covenant. When you read the New Testament, anything you read in the New Testament is under the New Covenant. We're going to talk about what a covenant is in a minute because it's a big deal. So then what is the purpose of the old? So if, if when we get a new phone, right, and we throw away the old, how come we didn't throw away the old covenant? Right? It's a good question. Why didn't we throw that away? Well, the early believers f- saw value in it. Look, just because things are old doesn't mean that there's no value. Right? In fact, it's the opposite. There's a lot of things that the older that they get, 
the more money they call, like they're valuable, right? Certain things, right? The older something gets, the more money, the more valuable it is. And so early Christians immediately realized there's something of value here. Everything that's in this Old Testament, everything that's in this Old Testament gives us the story. It shows us how we got here. It shows us what God has been doing this entire time, preparing the way for salvation through Jesus. So even though it's old, it doesn't mean that it is we don't throw it away. There's something valuable in this. And so they preserved it. They kept it. But here's the thing, though. Now what do we do with it? Well, the same thing that the Paul, the Paul and the apostles and everybody said to do. Listen, you do not, and us as Christians, we do not build our faith on the Old Testament. We build our faith to it. Let me explain what that means. Because sometimes you're like, all right, I want to be a believer in Jesus Christ. All right, cool. So then you look at some of these laws and some of these expressions and some of these things in the Old Testament. And be like, oh, wait a minute. How do I have to believe in that? Or does that apply to me? Does that apply to me today? I was like, well, hold on. What, what, what is the deal? Like, what do we then do with the Old Covenant? And so the thing is, guys, listen, you don't build your faith on it. Again, what do you build your faith on? What's the foundation of our faith? The resurrection you don't build your faith on the new I mean on, on the old testament and that's what a lot of people do they think hey I gotta believe all of it no matter what it is but then uh I don't know about what about that law that says hey uh God sanctions God sanctions uh, slavery in the old testament so that's the God you believe in God sanctioned uh murder and genocide so that's the God you believe in how are you gonna base your faith on that God, uh, oh, there's, uh, which by the way, um, uh, this was a good one because I had a, an atheist friend tell me this one. By the way, yes, atheist friend. I do have atheist friends. He told me this one. was like, uh, there's a law that I wrote that the, um, the rapist, if there's a guy who rapes a woman, the woman has to marry the rapist. That's the God you believe in, dude? I'm going to be honest. I didn't even know that was in there when he said it. I was like, bro, where'd you read that? Where'd you read that? I looked it up. I was like, uh-oh. That's in there. Which, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to answer that one yet because uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get to that one. And then I'm just going to let that just settle and be tense there. I'm going to settle that question in a little bit. But so the thing is that a lot of times we think, how can I believe in, in this? I'm not sure if I can believe in Jesus if, I mean, I don't know, if it, is creation, did that really happen? I don't know. Like, look, you don't have to, your faith does not, is not based on if God created creation in bang, he spoke it, or bang, everything happened, okay? Or if there was evolution or creation or not. Your faith in Christ does not depend on stuff like that. It's on Jesus and what he did. Now, there's stuff that matters, but, but that's, that's the point. I want you to see this. And so the, the, they realize that there's value in this old story. There's value in the Hebrew scriptures because it was the origin. They saw the connections. They saw Adam and the problem, Adam and Eve and sin entering the world, and then what God was doing through Abraham. And then Abraham called one man to make one nation. And then Moses leads that one nation out of slavery in Egypt over to the promised land. Joshua helps to conquer the land and become established. And then you got the time of the temple and the kings and the prophets all the way leading up to Egypt. And so all of these mini stories all culminating in one. This is why, listen, for those of you who are fans, which, by the way, I'm not going to spoil anything, you know, the biggest talk of the whole week has been Endgame, the Avengers movie that came out this, this week, right? I'm not going to say anything. Don't worry. But why has this movie been so popular? Because it's not just one movie. It was, it was 21 movies over 10 years leading to this one moment, right? For those of you, if, if you haven't, that's what I want you to say. It's not just a movie. It was 21 movies, over 10 years, telling individual stories, we would follow first Thor, you know, Iron Man, and then Captain America, and Thor, and, you know, uh, Black Widow, and all these guys, back and forth. And you would see these, they were from time to time, they would all come together, and then they would, we would follow their individual stories. And then in this movie, all 21 come together to tell one story, and pow, pops. Well, listen, okay, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or DC, you know, whatever, the DCU, okay, listen, it was in here first, okay? The Old Testament is all, is all of these stories that was happening. First Adam, then Moses, then this, then that. All of these stories that when you put them together, they culminate in Jesus. And it just sees, it makes, that's what makes the Jesus story so much better. When you see all of the other stories, the history that came to bow this moment. What led up to that? And so that's what the Jews were. But the thing is, though, they were Paul and all these guys were super on it. They were like, hey, uh, you don't base your faith on this because something happened, something new happened. You base your faith on the new. So the old is important. 
In fact, let me show you, buddy, uh, Michael, I'm not sure if you have 2 Timothy. I'm going to read it because you got a couple verses. Let me read this one. 2 Timothy, Paul is telling this guy, his protege, a student, Timothy, listen to what he says. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture. Now listen, Paul, even though Paul's letter is considered scripture, Paul was not talking about his letter. He did not know he was writing scripture when he said scripture. So when Paul says scriptures, what is he talking about? Old Testament. So he's saying everything in the Old Testament, all of it is good. All of it is good that it is profitable. It was breathed out by God. God said it for a reason, and it is still good. It's good for teaching, reproof, correction, training, righteousness, that we may be equipped, that we may understand what God has been doing so we can be a part of it. It's all good. But just because it's all good doesn't mean you have to obey all that's in it exactly. Because watch, look what he says. I, I know I have these. Look what he says first to this church in Rome. 15, 4 through 5. For whatever was written, I think this one you guys have, do you? Uh, yep, okay, oh yeah, Romans 15. For whatever was written in former days, what is he talking about? What written in what former days? Old Testament stuff. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, Old Covenant, Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, through all of those things that we may have hope. And so may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. So what? So he said, listen, the Old Testament is good for, it's good. It's good, but what is it for? It was written for an example, for our instruction. And look at one more. He writes to this church in Corinth, this city, this Greek city state, and he writes to 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 10, 11. He says, now all of these things, talking about what happened to the Jewish people, all of these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the age has come. Catch that? The end of the age has come. A new age has happened. And so the Old Testament is great. It's valuable. It's God's word. It is good for inspiration. It's good for instruction. Not good for application, though. Because there's certain things that Jesus, which we're going to talk about over the next couple, there's certain commands that Jesus amplified. There's certain commands that Jesus reversed that were in the old. There's certain things that he just canceled out altogether. And so, so that's where it's, it's good for inspiration. There's stories of struggle and of hope and of heroism. So many amazing things. The Old Testament is valuable, guys. Sometimes we skip on that, like, oh, let me just, let me just slide over to the new and just kind of stay there, right? Because, hey, we're, we're you know, Christians. We follow Jesus. I don't got to stick with the old. No, it's good. But it's good for inspiration. It's good for instruction. Because there's a lot of things that happen in the old that uh, guys made mistakes, Men and women made some mistakes. Why is it in there? Now, it doesn't give us an excuse to do it. It just shows us, hey, when you, this is what happens when you do this and when you do that. And so it's good for all of those things, but it is not good for application. It's something different because Jesus introduced what the application is. We're going to talk about that over the next couple of weeks. In fact, listen, I, I got this. This is a great quote from this theologian, N.T. Wright. He says in his book, The Climax of Covenant, he says this, the Torah or the Old Testament, what was written with the Jewish people, the, the first five books of, that Moses wrote. The Torah is given for a specific period of time, and then it is set aside, not because it was a bad thing now happily abolished, but because it was a good thing whose purpose had now been accomplished. Okay? So God had an old covenant with the nation of Israel. God had a covenant, a promise that he made with one nation, that through that one nation, all of the nations would be blessed. But it was a covenant with a time stamp on it. Israel was a means to an end. And all means have to come to an end. And so, and not because now, I know we don't throw away the old scriptures. We don't throw away the Jewish people because, okay, you guys are done. We're moving on. No, there's value. We are, you know, cherry still God's word, still God's people. But it's different. In fact, Jesus even said, listen, there's not one word that's in the, the law that will, it will be forever. Not one word will ever be changed or completed until it is fulfilled. But that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus did not abolish the Old Testament because it was flawed, because it was wrong, because it was bad. Okay? Instead, he fulfilled its purpose because it was good. And Jesus was very clear. He did not extend the old covenant into what he was doing. He was very clear with his language. He says, I'm going to do something new. Meaning, the old has now come to an end. 
In fact, let me just show you what I mean about that. Because see, listen, all covenants come with commands. All right. All covenants come with commands. And so the first, the old covenant had commands. We call them the Ten Commandments, right? You ever seen those? And by the way, you guys know there was more than ten? It was actually over 600, okay? But the ta- there was over 600 commands that, Moses, that God gave through Moses to the people, but the Ten Commandments were it's like that table of contents. Like all 600 commands are categorized into these ten categories. So it's easier to memorize ten commands than 600, and then and they kept on adding more laws to that. So And every new law had to co- coincide with one of the ten. So that's all it was. It was just the, the top ten. And so, but uh, the every co- covenant has commands. And Jesus' new covenant also had a command. Let's look at what it is. In John 13, 34, look what Jesus says. A new commandment I give you. Listen, when he says that word new, meaning that something is old, something is done, we're moving on. This is replacing something. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, just as you have loved one another. Now, if some of you, if you've read the gospels, you know that Jesus was asked and he would ask, What is the greatest commandment? Speaking of the old covenant. And he would say the phrase, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm pretty sure most of you guys have heard that. That was, and Jesus was rephrasing all 10 commandments and rephrasing them into two, summarizing them into two. All the commandments on the old covenant can be summarized in you're either loving God and loving people. Right? Love the Lord your God and love others as yourself. That was the old covenant. That was a summary of that. And in fact, have you ever heard of Jesus give the, the golden rule? Right? And you guys know what the golden rule is? Treat others the way you would like to be treated. Right? You treat others. Unfortunately, a lot of us today, we like to treat others the way people treat us. Right? That's kind of what we do. We like to, oh, you're going to be like that? Okay. Oh, watch me. Right? Like, oh, watch me. I'm going to one-up you real quick. Like, you know, we like to treat others the way we think it's fair. Oh, you're going to treat me like that? Okay, I got you. All right. We like to treat others the way people treat us. Jesus said, no, you, you should treat others the way you want to be treated. But now when Jesus says a new commandment, he is not saying, hey, I know I told you guys the greatest commandment was love God, love others. So let me say that in a new way. No, that's not what Jesus said. He's not saying, let me rephrase what I said earlier to you in a new way. No, I have a new commandment. Love others as I have loved you. See, now, see, before, hey, I get to love God and love others. But the context was difficult because everybody just cared about loving God and the loving others was defined by, in their case, as a Jewish people, loving Jews only, okay? Because God was doing something unique in the Old Testament. He was preserving something in one nation so that others could be blessed. And so the loving others was loving others like you, loving others who look like you, act like you, believe in you. But now Jesus says, no, love others the way I have loved you. You are people of the most unlike God, yet God still loves us and likes us, right? And so he's saying, no, this is different now. Your love for people, your love for me is now determined by your love for people. See, in the old covenant, it was not like that. In the old covenant, it's not like that. In the new covenant, your love for God is proved by your love for people. Love others the way I have loved you. This isn't even the golden, I mean, he's throwing away the golden rule. Like, I mean, when he says a new commandment, he's throwing away the golden rule. It is now no longer treat others the way you would like to be treated because what's the problem with that? Who's defining the level of quality of treatment? You. If you say treat others the way you want to be treated, you are de- de- determining the terms of what sh- how somebody should be treated. Now God is saying, no, treat others the way I have treated you. It's new. Love others the way I have loved you. That's the rule. One law to rule them all. That's it. A new commandment I give you, love others. See, here's the thing, guys. In the Old Testament, here's the game you had to play in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was obey and then you'll be blessed. That was the Old Testament covenant. Obey and be blessed. This is why modern day we call this the, go- the prosperity gospel. Like, hey, if you do the right thing, right things happen to you. If you obey, if you give, God's going to give right back. If you do everything right, everything's going to go right in your life. That's mixing and matching. That's old covenant stuff. That's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to get rid of that. Because back in the day, if you, if you obey, you're blessed. And the reason, but it was good for a purpose because God was trying to protect something. He was trying to preserve something in one nation so that the other nations would be blessed. And so he wanted to give them incentive. Hey, obey, stay in line, follow in. Things are going to go good. But if you want to be a part of this, all right, then suffer the consequences. Be out there. You do you, but I'm doing this. So I want you to play ball, be in this together. 
and obey and be blessed. But listen, now it's different. God, the new is not obey and be blessed. It's, it's, literally, it's a whole lot different than that. Because back then, if you do the right thing, the right thing would happen. Now, in the new covenant, you can do the right thing and you can suffer for it. And then you can do the wrong thing and the world would stand and applaud you. Be like, hold on, dude. I think I like the old one better. <laughs> I was like, I think I like the one where I do the right thing and right things happen. I, I like that. You know, I was like, why do I got to do the right thing and suffer? And I can do the wrong thing and have more friends? What the? That doesn't sound fair. And I was like, that doesn't sound right. I don't know if I like this new. Okay, can we, can we flip back to the old? And so, but listen, to some, I know to some it might sound unfair, but listen, to a lot of believers in Christ and especially over the centuries, they saw that as their duty and as their honor to be the light of Jesus, even if things didn't always go the right way, if, if people responded a certain way. If it, they saw it as an honor, why? Because God had treated them so well, how could they not show their appreciation by improving the way that they, sh they treated others? Like, to them, it was more. What wasn't fair was God having to die on the cross for their sins. Jesus died on the cross for sins he didn't commit. That wasn't fair. Yet he allowed it to happen so something good can happen through us. And so, for some, as I, and, and God is doing something new in the world. And so here's this with this covenant, guys. I want you to check this out. And this is where we're going to culminate to this. Because in the old, co every covenant had commands. So we see Jesus had a new covenant and he had a new command to it. You know, so all covenants have commands. Old Testament had them, New Testament had them. And so here's a weird, I know I'm mispronouncing this, but let me tell you what the old covenant was. Ready? By the way, I love this detail. Do you know what covenant means? I want you to repeat after me. Say this. Say, uh, cut a deal. Say it again. Say, cut a deal. To a covenant means to cut a deal. So when in the Old Testament, God cut a deal with the Jewish people. He said, all right, let's make a, all right, let's make a deal here, you and me. All right? And what God did with the nation of Israel is something called a bilateral suzerainty treaty, or the bilateral treaty, meaning this. It was a covenant made by unequal partners, where you have one more powerful than the other. And this was something that back in the day ancient people would do. You would have one tribe that was bigger, and they would combine with another tribe who was not as powerful, and there was an agreement that came to be. And so here's what that agreement looked like. You would have one nation, one bigger nation, say, hey, I promise to be this and to do this for you. You, okay, I promise to be this and do this for you. And usually this agreement was, if you don't hold your end of the deal, I don't have to fulfill mine. That was the deal that you would be made. So for the smaller, for the bigger companies or bigger, bigger tribes, it was better because look, I'm not going to bend my, you know, bend over backwards for you if you're not going to play ball, if you're not going to be a part of this, all right? So that's what, God did, that's what God did with Israel. So here's God, a big God, making a treaty with a, a brand new, you know, slave people. So they're saying, listen, if you obey, I think it's going to go good. All right? It's going to be great. Land flowing, milk and honey, all that stuff. All right? But if not, okay. This is like, imagine like a relationship between parents and kids. So here's the parents setting up the rules, curfew, expectations, right? A parent can uh, withhold a reward or issue a punishment if the child does not comply. Am I good with that? Any moms and dads? Amen. Right? And so you get that, right? So that's what a bilateral agreement between unequal partners was. That's what God did with Israel. And it was, by the way, you notice, if you read the Old Testament, pay attention to any phrases like this. If you, then I. That's all over the Old Testament. If you do this, God tells his people, then I will do. That's the bilateral agreement. That's like saying, look, you hold your end of the deal. I'm a whole, I don't have to give you anything if you don't want to play ball. If you, then I. If my people who are called by my name will answer, then I will. That's old covenant promise. Our promise in Jesus is better than that one. Because here's the thing. God, if you, then I, meaning if you don't do, then I don't have to do. That was all old covenant stuff. And you know what? Plenty of times the nation of Israel abandoned faith in God. And God says, okay, then I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you do what you want to do. You want to go do that? All right, fine. And he would let them. And he would not hold his, fulfill his end of the bargain because the people chose not to. And they would go enslaved and bad things would happen and this and that. Here's the thing. With the old covenant, listen, it was always if you do, then I. It was obey, then be blessed. It was very self-focused. Like people were just all about themselves. It was all about doing right by God. And you are responsible for how your behavior impacts you. That's old covenant stuff. 
You are responsible for how your behavior impacts you. And so this is what God did with Abraham. But again, what's amazing is that God, the, the nation of Israel were unfaithful with their promises. But when you read the Old Testament, how come God kept on being faithful though? They would break up and then God would bring them back. And then break up and God would bring them back. Break up and God would bring them back. God didn't have to do that because that other nation didn't fulfill their end of the bargain. Why was he so faithful? Because of a different covenant that God cut with Abraham first. He cut a different, he didn't cut a, an agreement between him and Abraham like he did with Israel. Because see, with, it's interesting, God cuts this deal with Israel, first off, by cutting animals, the lamb was sacrificed, and then they walked through this aisle of water through, you know, Moses separates the sea. So here's blood. They're walking down an aisle and then on Mount Sinai, they commit to each other, their promises to one another. And that was what happened there. But see, God did a different one with Abraham. In Genesis 15, God cuts a deal with Abraham and Abraham cuts a bunch of animals in half. That would, by the way, that's when they called to cut a deal because usually they would cut stuff, okay? And so they would cut animals to make this deal. And here's, they would make a blood bond. This is crazy. I, I couldn't imagine. So here's Abraham with God. And God says to Abraham, Abraham, you're just one dude, but I'm going to cut a covenant with you that through this one nation, the world will be blessed. So Abraham was like, all right. So he knows it's going to happen. So traditionally, here's what they would do. Anim they would go and cut animals in half. And they would lay one animal on one side, one animal on the other. And they would create two aisles of just carcasses, okay? And then the, pool, the blood would pool into the center. And so what would happen would be representatives from each party or each tribe would walk down an aisle of blood and make a blood, blood bond. They would walk down the aisle of blood. Here's blood unifying. And then they're all mixed and covered in it. And then they would, you know, give of something. Hey, here's my jacket. You got to trade jackets, whatever. I promise, I promise. Okay, that's what would happen. And, uh, and so God does this, but it's not a, he doesn't make a, hey, Abraham, if you do this, then I. He makes a different promise. He makes a promissory covenant, a covenant with a promise to it. And here's the thing. Right when Abraham sets everything up, we see that God causes Abraham to fall asleep. Abraham lays down. He falls asleep. Abraham can't get up and walk down the aisle with God because God did not want him to. Because God was saying, instead, we see these images of a torch and a lantern going down the aisle. And it's representative of God. God is saying, Abraham, I need you to sleep on this for a second. I'm going to make this covenant with you, but you don't have to be a part of this because now I'm taking full responsibility. See, Abraham, regardless of how well you fulfill your end of the deal, I will, build, I will be faithful no matter what. You might not be faithful. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like wedding vows. A wedding vow is, right, through sickness, health, death to his part, right? That's a, so meaning a wedding vows are, hey, buddy, if you do what I ask you to do, then I'm going to be nice to you. But if not, get ready. All right, that, like that, that's, no, that's not a wedding vow. That's not a wedding vow. Unfortunately, a lot of people get married today with that understanding. That's why there's so much divorce. Oh, you going to be like that now? All right, I'm going to be this. I'm going to do this way. No, see, true wedding vows are, regardless if you're going to, regardless of how you behave, I'm going to be faithful. That's true wedding vows. Regardless of how well you keep your end of the bargain, I'm going to keep mine no matter what. And that's why God made that promise with Abraham. Even though Israel was unfaithful, he had promised Abraham, Abraham, no matter what, I'm going to be faithful to this promise I'm making with you. I'm going to be promised because, you know, this is going to happen. And so here, God walks down the aisle by himself to issue a covenant with Abraham. And him saying, yo, it's all on me. Taking all full responsibility. What God did with Abraham was global. Was, uh, what God did with the nation of Israel was just national. But what he did with Abraham was meant to go global. And now here, Jesus. Jesus now, right before he goes on the cross, he takes an old covenant tradition of Passover, the one I mentioned before, the tradition of re the, remi the reminder of how the covenant, the old covenant that God made with Israel. Jesus takes an old covenant tradition and uses it to inaugurate the new covenant that he's about to make between himself and the nations of the world, not just one nation. So look, look at Luke 22, 19 through 20. So check this out. Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to everybody, saying, this is my body, which I give to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup he takes and eating and says, this cup was poured out for you in the new covenant. Jesus was not... He was letting them know, hey, I'm about to cut a new deal with y'all. I'm going to cut a new deal. 
I have a new covenant for you. I have a new command. And this is not just for one people. It's for all people. And he uses this Passover analogy of the bread and the, and the blood. And he's about to now go on the cross where there would be one piece of bread that would be broken and shared with everybody, right? One bread for all. Jesus saying, my body is now is going to be that bread. One body ripped to shreds for everyone. The bread was going to take the punishment of death that sin brought. And then he says, but then I have now this cup of wine, this cup, which by the way, have you ever seen wine? You know how you make it, right? You take grapes, you crush grapes. And when you crush the grapes, the juice comes out. Jesus was about to be crushed and his blood was going to flow and that blood was going to give us life. His death, the body was going to take the punishment of death, and then he was going to be crushed so that we could have life. He was going to cut a new covenant with the world by having himself being literally cut and bruised and hung on a cross. And just like, listen, just like Abraham, this is, he didn't make a covenant like he did with Israel. He, re, he, he honored Abraham's. In the same way that Abraham, God went down the aisle by himself and says, Abraham, you can't do this. I take full responsibility. Jesus carries a cross, creates a trail of blood as he walks up the hill. And he dies on the cross alone saying, I'm going to cut a covenant with the whole world. But guys, I got to do this by myself. I'm taking full responsibility. This is all on me. And I will be faithful no matter what. No matter, it's not if you. It's not no longer if you do, then I. It's no longer obey and be blessed. It's no longer being self-focused. It's different. It's not, it's not if you do, then I. No, it's because I have done, now you do. That's the new covenant that we have. Because I have done, now you do. It's not obey and be blessed. It's love because you are loved. It's different. It's not self-centered. It is others focused. It's not do right by God. No, it's do right by others. It is not no longer, hey, you are responsible for how your behavior impacts you. No, you are now responsible for how your behavior impacts others. This is a new covenant that I'm doing. And I'm, and I'm cutting this covenant with you alone. Just me. My body replacing ex in exchange for yours. My life in exchange for yours. And I promise that I will love you no matter what. And that's not going to change until his love changes us. See, everything in the old covenant, guys, again, it's good. It's amazing. It still has incredible value. It is still God's word in, that is great for inspiration and instruction. But that old covenant shows us the story and points us and leads us to the way on this new covenant that we have with Christ. See, no longer, guys, do we have to feel like we got to obey to be blessed. Now through Jesus, we are called to love because we are loved. The old, if you, then I agreement is over. The new, because I have done, now you do lifestyle, has begun. 